Coming up on this week in computer hardware, RTX 2070. We got benchmarks in a review. Don't buy a new Mac before the 30th. Samsung hits 7 nanometer, ARM's Neoverse, and Palm's back, but it's a tiny phone from TCL. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 488, recorded on October 18th, 2018. RTX 2070, we've got a review. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. Learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show, the name to bring you the most engaging, most delightful, most useful, most frivolous, most serious, most authoritative, most speculative, mostly we're talking about the hardware. Desktop, laptops, mobile, consoles, Internet of Things, single board computers, dancing weasels, we cover it all here. Actually, I don't think we've ever covered a dancing weasel, weasel or any weasel dancing or otherwise. But the dulcet tones you just heard for a brief moment. Mr. Alan Malventano, there may be a large, large cat somewhere near him right now in beautiful Florence, Kentucky. Welcome back, Alan. I, I don't know. The, the cat sauntered off somewhere. Who knows? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, you know, maybe we'll do the dancing weasels next week. Who knows? <laughs> I like that thought. We have a broad array of hardware to discuss on the, on the show today. Uh, almost so much we might not get to cover it all, um, but we should probably start with something I think we've all been waiting for, uh, the uh, NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2070 review. You guys got an EVGA card in. What uh, what was the findings? And once Mr. Addison was done with the benchmarking and the weeping and the counseling and all the <laughs> stuff that goes into a, a, a benchmarking session, at PC per well, actually, I guess technically he didn't need counseling this time. But how'd it go? No, no, uh, not not because time. it was 2070 versus 1080. Where are you leaning at this point? Yeah, because that's kind of where we've been seeing them fall, right? Usually, the the new generation, you go one rung up from the previous generation on that line, and that's kind of your starting point of where the you'd kind of expect the performance to sit. Um, that was the case here, uh, and then some. We were seeing like probably five or ten percent better um, for the from the 2070. That's on top of a GTX 1080, um, and that's just you know testing various titles, uh, you know just various current games, uh, current game titles. Uh, we tested at um, 1440p and 4K. Um, you know, just it's funny, even with this kind of a lower end card, you don't really need mm -hmm. to. If you go down to 1080p, the card's just going to scream. Um, you know, so definitely uh, playable with games with decent settings at 1440p. And even you can even get up upwards into the 4K range depending on what you're playing and where you have your settings setting. So uh, the, the interesting point here uh, is that of the prices, that we've seen for the 2000 series NVIDIA cards. Um, you know, they did this at their launch. They had Founders Edition cards, which were 100 or even $200 above what the like standard price for the cards should be. Uh, but we haven't really seen any cards hit the standard prices from, you know, for example, 2080 TIs or 2080s. Uh, however, for the 2070, the first card we reviewed is this EVGA card. Uh, I believe it's a black edition uh, 2070 um, is actually selling for 500 bucks, which is I was going to say the I'm, you know, I'm, that's I'm the up price on, it was supposed to launch at, right? No, no, um, I'm with you. I'm up on Newegg, like EVGA, Asus, MSI, Gigabyte, all have cards at 499.99. Um, right. There's right. a couple more expensive um, cards out there. But yeah, you can actually you know, like, buy the cards at the price. Yes, yes, you can buy the cards <laughs> at the price. Uh, that's that's good, right? Um, it is still you still have to take into consideration that you know it's been a couple of years, and at that particular price point, we're still kind of getting this amount of performance, right? Because if you think back, 
you know, the, the 1080, which is what we're comparing this card to, that went for around 500 bucks. Um, so that part of it is kind of disappointing, but it is what it is. That's kind of the whole graphics card landscape right now, partially due to Bitcoin, and I guess it's mainly due to Bitcoin still. I don't know. It, it should be coming down. I don't understand why it's not at the, by this point, because it's, uh, you know, the profitability has come down on a lot of stuff, so there's not mobs of people just scraping up batches of uh, graphics cards off the market and kind of driving prices up for everybody. At least not anymore, as far as I know. Um, either way, uh, you have decent cards at you know decent performance levels for at the price point of $500. And for the uh, RTX cards in particular, even though it's all the way down, you know, a few rungs down from the top of the line model, uh, this card does still have the RTX cores. It does still have Turing. Granted, it's a smaller one. Um, it will still be able to do ray tracing in some way, shape, or form once, uh, you know, supported by titles that that come out. Um, mm -hmm. So you still have those extra bells and whistles that you can't take advantage of yet, necessarily, but they're there. So right. uh, between between that... Uh, that little tidbit, the performance gain over a 1080, uh, the price being reasonably close. Um, I'd basically say, you know, if you have a 1080 or even a 1080 Ti, don't run out and like buy an mm -hmm. RTX card. Not yet. Um, you know, if anything, give them a little more time to come down in price. But if you're looking for, you're in the market for a graphics card right now, uh, and you're okay with this particular performance level, which is really not too shabby at all, um, then it's probably worth considering going this route, you know, 2070 route versus going after a, a 1080, which would probably be close in price. Um, mm -hmm. But you wouldn't get those extra features that might give you a, a, a more enhanced experience, you know, moving forward uh, with some future titles. Um, it's, I was going to say, it's interesting to watch some of the... Uh... It's interesting to watch, uh, like I'm up on Newegg and, um, you know, I've been waiting to buy a card and I need a card under 215 millimeters for a particular build. And the number of cards available has been literally in the last couple of weeks has started. There's now less than six cards available that are like a 1080, a 1070 or a 1070 TI that are under 215 millimeters. Um, the prices are, are, have dropped a bit. And I, I think, you know, certainly with some of the more obscure cards, I think they're finally running out of, uh, starting to run out of inventory. And, uh, yeah. but, uh, it's yep, going to be yep. tough to find some of these cards soon, the previous generation, which I suppose is good. I mean, I'm just thrilled to see the GTX 1070 actually selling for the launch price. I just need one that's like 50 millimeters shorter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, I was happy to see that this particular card is a actual two-slot card, uh, you know, thir third-party card, you know, because um, what we've been seeing from the 2080 Ti and the 2080s that have been coming out, they've been these two and three fan sort of monstrosities, if you will, that are like two and a half right. to three slot width, uh, which is just kind of kind of up there, um, especially given, you know, that the power draws are similar to what we were seeing from cards in the previous generation and mm -hmm. you had 1080 TIs that there were plenty of them that were not two and a half slot cards and were still able to you know be very good cards like an EBGA FTW3 for example you know a triple fan card decent size card but still only two slots right, right. Um, so I'm glad to see uh, two slots here uh, this card isn't too large, although they actually did, ex EVGA did extend the reference PCB a little bit, as you can see right there. Um, you know, the the card design uh, of the heatsink portion kind of extends another few inches uh, past the tail end of the card, and that's just to help it with, uh, you know, with cooling. Uh, and even overclocked, um, first of all, we saw decent... Uh, clock rates. Most of these Turing uh, GPUs, it looks like most of them just like to go up to 2 gigahertz. Uh, regardless of, you know, uh, 2080 Ti all the way down to, in this case, 2070. Um, it's just you have fewer cores that are going that fast, but all of these cards, generally speaking, seem to be comfortable uh, pushing close to 2 gigahertz uh, clock rates. Um, but this particular card, 
because the power consumption is lower. It's only around 180 watts, I believe. It's like 170, 180. Um, temperature stayed around 60 C, maybe 65 C. So uh, that's not the point where the card's going to start pulling back on you. Um, so, no, so in other words, it just comfortably runs close to 2 gigahertz and probably just do it all day, um, really. So, uh, you know, good on it there. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, and there's also this new, uh, I forget the name of the, uh, of the, oh, NVIDIA scanner. That's their new kind of overclocking, uh, mechanism, like automatic overclocking mechanism that, um, EVGA Precision X and, uh, you know, MSI Afterburner and all, all those, uh, the different th sort of third party utilities are able to trigger this, uh, NVIDIA scanner mechanism and I think you let it sit for somewhere around 10 minutes uh, and it comes back and it's kind of figured out its overclocking curves um, in, in an automatic fashion. And it gets you, you know, actually these results that we were just showing on the screen, those, those were the result of the NVIDIA scanner. Um, that's kind of all that Ken has been doing lately. Uh, you just kind of just hit the overclock button and don't sit there and try to do a bunch of trial and error. I'm sure we could squeeze more out of the GPU doing that, but the NVIDIA scanner is pretty good about getting you close to the threshold, but not really pushing past it because it's actually going to be a little more conservative over what you might get out of a manual overclocking session with trial and error because it's doing a computational workload. It knows the answer to the math it's trying to do. So it does this math. If it gets the right answer, okay, now maybe I can push it a little higher. So that's the sort of thing where it'll be a little more sensitive or even if like one bit uh, goes the wrong way, uh, then this thing is going to, you know, not come to the correct conclusion and it's going to back itself off a little bit from that point just automatically as far as the overclock goes uh, versus your typical manual overclock where you're only looking for graphical artifacts that make it all the way to the screen and, you know, gr crashes and whatnot. You might actually push it a little bit further, but, uh, you know, there could be other instances or, or different games that might actually cause that overclock to be unstable somewhere down the line. So I just think you're a little safer, uh, maybe not safer, but just convenience wise or stability wise, uh, just going with the NVIDIA scanner and sticking with what it gives you. You know, you might be able to get a few more percent out of it, but you're, you're kind of diminishing returns on stability once you're, once you're kind of pushing the bleeding edge there. Um, but yeah, you know, decent GPUs for 500 bucks, which, um, uh, I, I know it's still kind of up there. I know we're missing the the super budget stuff, but if you're if you're really on the budget, I would imagine there's probably people starting to sell GPUs uh, from the prior generation. And if you were really really worried about budget, you know, go for one of those. If you have a GPU that's several generations old and you're just trying to look for a stopgap, you know, GTX 1080s they're down under five hundred dollars. I'm I'm trying to find like the least you know, it's. You know, on the upside, at least you're you're going to be able to get a, a 1080 or a 1070 Ti for less than what you would be paying for a you know a, a TX 2070 at this point. Um, right. But it's it's yeah. amazing to realize you know it seems like the 1080 Ti's are kind of getting thin on inventory. Um, yeah, that's why my take on it is kind of. That's why my take on it is kind of like, you know, it's only a, few, it's, it's not that much difference cost wise right. going between those prior generation cards that perform equivalent to this card. Um, they're actually a little bit behind it, right? Like 1080 is, you know, five, 10% behind this RTX 2070. So that's why I'm kind of leaning towards, you know, my recommendation would be if you're in the market right now for a new GPU, you should probably consider that, you know, these uh, 2070s, if that's your particular performance uh, price right. point that you're after. Um, it just kind of makes sense to go with the newer generation thing as opposed to the card been on the market for, you know, pushing a couple of years, right? No, I, I think uh, at this point, it's it, given that there's, at, at, at the 2070 level, it, it kind of seems silly right now to buy a 1080 or a 1070. Well, the 1070 has got a, a pretty healthy price drop, but... Um, uh, you know, the 1080s yeah, are, but, are priced within 20 bucks. The 1070s, 1070 Ti, well, 1070 Ti's are, yeah, man, you're like at 460 bucks for a 1070 yeah. Ti. 
See what I mean? The cheapest 1070 Ti I can find. Ten, here's one for 443. That's still within 55 bucks. 429. I mean, those those prices are roughly proportional, uh, right. like f- f- as far as performance per dollar, right? Com- <laughs> even compared to this RTX 2070, you're you're basically within a percent or two of right. You know, you you getting your money's worth of the performance, regardless of what you know whether you go with the 1070 Ti or a 1080 or a 2070 in this case. I mean, which is if you if you shop around, you know, it's amazing because I'm looking at 1070 Ti prices anywhere from like 390 bucks up to almost 500. And uh, yeah, if you, you know. can, 390 is a, a decent price for a 1070 uh, Ti. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a little bit. There aren't a lot of cards down there, but you know, three. Yeah, you're looking at like three ninety, four ten, um, yeah, four twenty. Yeah, it's finally to the point where you know, twenty seventy is. That's looking like the sweet spot for most people, I think, at this point, especially yeah, yeah. if you're so, finally thinking and, about and, upgrading that ten eighty p monitor. You know, and the and like the ten seventy was meant to be a, a budget solution, so. It, Makes sense that the 2070 is trying to fall in the same bracket, just the modern version of the budget solution. Um, <laughs> the modern budget solution. The modern budget solution. And you're getting way more performance compared to the previous right. 1070. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't even think we compared. I don't even think we compared against a 1070 uh, in the reviews because it was just you know the performance delta was was just you know kind of makes fun of it. Right, if you go from a 1070 to a 27 RTX 2070, so yeah, we actually uh, Ken's been busy. Uh, he reviewed that EVGA card, and uh, we also reviewed an MSI card um, <laughs> of the same flavor, RTX 2070. Uh, it's a MSI Armor card, um, slightly different design. Uh, I think this one was maybe is around around the same length, but MSI added like an inch and a half to the height. It's just you know. It's pretty tall. So take that into consideration. Uh, some cases don't like that, uh, right? Mm-hmm. Some, some uh, depending on the form factor of the case, uh, some cases tend to be even like sl- slimmer these days and their GPUs or slots, are, you know, they're set up without ribbon cables and without reorienting GPUs and they kind of just need to install it the normal way. Uh, you might run into headroom issues there. Um, yeah, the... Um, as far as performance and everything else goes, uh, the the EVGA card we just talked about mm-hmm. is not overclocked at all uh, out of the box, which is kind of not not typical for like an EVGA Black Edition card. Usually they they add like at least a few megahertz of an overclock over like the base base. Um, sure. In this case, things are a little bit kind of reorganized or rearranged the way Nvidia did this. They're the Nvidia Founders cards have a slight overclock from NVIDIA, which is odd mm-hmm. because that's the reference card you would consider, um, or the reference design. So you'd figure that would be the reference, but no, uh, those are actually a little bit boosted um, you know, out of the box. The EVGA card was not boosted out of the box, but again, it's trivial to overclock these things now with the, you know, with the NVIDIA um, tools kind of built into the, the architecture to do that. Um, right. This uh, MSI card comes again, same price, uh, so, you know, same even five hundred dollars. Um, slightly larger card. Uh, it is not the reference PCB design. This allows MSI to go dial the power limit a little bit higher uh, than the reference design, which let them a uh, overclock it a little bit base base clock wise from you know like your base overclock, if you will. Uh, straight from them, and then if you do want to get into overclocking it on your own, with even with the the NVIDIA tools, uh, or even manual overclocking, just by using um, the built-in automatic overclocking, uh, Ken got a little bit more out of this one than the EVGA card. Um, cool. So realize this is the same GPU; it's just a you know a slightly different PCB design. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we now it wasn't a huge difference, but we I, we got to like an actual two gigahertz, not like just under it. Um, and it was very good at holding that frequency. Uh, actually, I think it's uh, the next 
chart down. There you go. So blue line just riding two gigahertz even. Uh, temperatures were a little higher, kind of understandable because the the fan design is similar uh, to EVGAs, but this card is drawing you know like maybe another ten or fifteen watts. So right. you're just you're just gonna end up with uh, you know slightly warmer GPU, but not warm enough to where it has to start uh, you know pulling back on its clocks. So and and we found that being the case for most of these Turing GPUs, just generally all the way across the range, uh, nine times out of ten. Um, it doesn't ride, the card does not ride the temperature limit. Uh, typically the fan design, even from the uh, even from the founder's cards, since they're now twin fan designs and not the old, older uh, blower designs, uh, the cards usually have no issues with temperature. It's just riding its power limit. Basically, it's it's pushing as many electrons through the GPU as, as NVIDIA has deemed safe um, without potentially, you know, eroding uh, transistors and... and uh, you know, and silicon in ways that might make it so that the card doesn't last, you know, how long it should last, right? Um, granted, GPUs don't like fail left and right necessarily, and usually when they do, it's some circuit outside of the GPU. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen one, uh, seen a GPU fail where it's actually the silicon failed, but that's probably a result of, you know, both NVIDIA and AMD preventing people <laughs> from going crazy with how much juice they, they pump through the GPU itself, right? right. Usually what yet. fails is just... Yeah, <laughs> Surely yeah, one will fail. <laughs> You'll have a silicon fail at some point. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. But usually whenever we see these cards <laughs> fail, there's there's usually some obvious evidence of the failure, and it's usually some right. power circuit that's outside the GPU that just got, you know, toasty and charbroiled uh, and let the magic smoke out. It's usually what happens. Um, usually. So yeah, I mean, you know, two two good uh, good examples of uh, RTX 2070 that we've looked at. Um, I don't think NVIDIA sampled many of the founders' versions of those. Uh, they do sell them. They sell them for $100 more than these, which is kind of like, why would you buy that when you can just spend $100 less on something that's already a budget thing that you're trying to save some money on? Uh, right. So my recommendation would be take a look at you know this MSI one or the EVGA one, and uh, you're, you're going to get very similar performance, uh, especially when overclocked. They're all going to be you know very close to the end result uh, of an overclocked Founders Edition, as an example. It's probably going to perform very similarly. So yeah, good good stuff to consider. Uh, it's just um, just hoping prices come down. I mean, we you know we got holiday stuff coming up. I suppose. <laughs> Uh, we need some shorter cards. We need some shorter yeah. 2070s, damn it. <laughs> we do, we do. Or even uh, 2060 if that happens. I'm not I, I don't know. I don't know. I have no info on it either way, but I would imagine at some point uh you would have an even lower power version of this that probably performed as well as a 1070. Right. You know, just follow the same trend, right? Um Be interesting to see. Yeah. Yep, yep. Oh my goodness. Uh while we're uh Moving from fact to rumor, or from testing to rumor, um, Absinthe uh, Media Invites, New York City, Tuesday, October 30th, Brooklyn Academy of Music at the Howard Gilman Opera House, an October event. Basically stuff that wasn't at the iPhone event in September, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. It's a beautiful purple graphic. There's more in the making. It looks like cotton candy or smoke. Or, you know, vaporized souls or something like that. But uh, all sorts <laughs> of different, uh, a bunch of different logos were done there. But uh, the short version of it is uh, expect to see iPad Pros, um, Mac updates. And uh, this is the official warning. If you're thinking about buying an iPad Pro, or if you're thinking about buying a new Mac, do yourself a favor and wait 12 days. You might be happy if you do. And if you scroll down a little bit more, you'll see the mock-up of the uh, the iPad Pro Home Buttonless Edition. Um, mm. I also uh, I also want to give a shout out to uh, Mac Rumors for this line quote: "The Mac Mini, which has not been updated for more than one thousand four hundred days, is expected <laughs> to be refreshed for the first time since 2014." So, you know, uh, <laughs> 2014 is yeah. 1,400 days ago. Like, that's, that's disappointing to me. 
We don't know what to expect, but it'll probably have faster stuff inside of it is basically what they say. Uh, I mean, I would hope so. Yeah, one would hope so. Uh, it's yeah. crazy to realize that, that, yeah, the Mac Mini has been, uh, uh, yeah, it hasn't been updated in a long, long time. So, um, you know, they were also speculating they're, they're, they might hear about the rumored Mac Pro uh, that's supposed to come out in 2019. But right now, expect iPad Pros, a Mac Mini update, um, and uh, refreshes to the MacBook line. So if you're thinking about buying Apple hardware, especially a Mac Mini or an iPad Pro, wait. Wait for 12 days. Um, I, do find it, uh, I do find it interesting that they're doing this in New York. Uh, I would have thought they'd be getting all the use possible they could out of their new campus and the theater. It's a lot of media. There. Yeah, maybe people. Uh, I know. Vaulting. I know. If, you, yeah, if you've ever tried to get to, to Cupertino, um, if you've ever tried to get to, or maybe they've got something that's particularly uh, attractive to the New York media, but um, maybe who knows? You know, it's the it's, big Apple. That's true. <laughs> that yeah, is they've true. Had, they've had decades to be part of the big Apple. It's our long-suffering producer, Kevin, chiming in there. Um, yep, yep. The man cannot back away from a good pun or a bad pun. The uh, Arm and Neoverse, <laughs> which the first three times I read this article, I, I was snickering. And uh, Kevin, feel free to pun on Neoverse because I will be flabbergasted and delighted if you can do one on that one. Um, but uh, a couple days ago, uh, Josh Walrath, uh, writes up on PC per uh, arm has announced their new uh, design and technology push called arm neoverse, which of course immediately has me going to the matrix for obvious reasons. Um, uh, but to basically next generation arm technology quote, and I love this from the edge to the core data center. And uh, everybody knows that arm processors, you know, they're, they're in your laptops, they're in your, well, your phones, your tablets, they're showing up in laptops now. Um, one of the things that Josh points out is that, that ARM's got like 30% of the market share for high-end routers and switches used at the enterprise level, i.e. the back-end stuff, um, the infrastructure that powers the entire user experience. And uh, ARM intends to hold that ground and probably uh, gain as much as they can uh, from Intel and other places. So, uh, the other thing is funny. It's a lot of marketing fluff. Um, Arm Neoverse, a new vision and unifying brand identity for the ARM-based technology powering the infrastructure from the core data center to the edge. Basically, it's a new road ramp. Um, you know, they're talking about 30% annual system performance gains uh, at the leading edge, which is pretty uh, impressive if they can pull it off. And, uh, yeah. you know... They're also basically talking about having all of the tools in place uh, for hardware developers and software developers. Um, quote, innovation from the micro architecture all the way up to the hardware, software, tools, and services. And they've, there's a really great, if you scroll down on the page um, where it says ARM number one market share and in infrastructure, uh, it's pretty crazy. They're talking about servers, routers, like, you know, wide area network routers, gateways, cellular base stations, uh, the top of racks, which is, and you look at like 2011 and they're 5% of the kind of the, uh, the market and they're knocking on the door at 30%. Um, so they want to be the one. <laughs> well done. Um, they do. Uh, they do. And technically, you could say they already are the one because they're claiming they're the number one in market share and infrastructure. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, they're basically they got four platforms. They're mapping it out through 2021. Uh, and they're really seriously about talking about a 30 percent increase in overall performance um, between process technology and architectural changes. So I would be very curious to see uh, how that works out. Cosmos is what they're now codenaming the current architecture that's on 16 nanometer parts. Ares, uh, which will use Cortex A76 designs and seven nanometer process. Uh, 2020, they're gonna go to Zeus, which you know is a bold name for a cat in my house or uh, a platform. And they're gonna talk about seven nanometer plus process technologies. And then Poseidon in 2021, uh, and they're anticipating five nanometer process for that one. So hopefully, 
the rest of the industry doesn't do what Intel did, uh, chasing five nanometer, while Intel still attempts to chase uh, seven nanometer or ten nanometer for that matter. But uh, uh, yeah, that that basically takes them out through 2021, and some pretty if they can pull it off, some pretty outrageous uh, performance gains. So you know, hopefully uh, that works out. And while we're talking Samsung. I actually say 7 nanometer. We should be talking about Samsung. And the Inquirer's got a good article. Uh, Nantech wrote up another article. And they're both talking about uh, Samsung. Well, the Inquirer head's pretty blunt. Uh, Samsung claims to have nailed making 7 nanometer chips with extreme ultraviolet light. And uh, so uh, 7 nanometer LPP process up and running for cranking out chips, writes uh, Roland Moore Collier over at the Inquirer. Um, uh you know, basically extreme ultraviolet rays to create uh, the circuit. Um, you know, etching transistors, forming the processor circuits directly on the silicon waiver, uh, or wafer, not waiver. <laughs> waiver is something lawyers do, a wafer it's something that's made in the fab. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really curious about that because what this means, um, there's no argon fluoride immersion for chip lithography in this case. Um, they're stenciling the transistors on the silicon. Um, yeah. And you're talking about... There's, there's fewer production. steps in the process, supposedly. Yeah, that's, that's big. Um, yeah, that is big. So, uh, you know, EOV has also gotten down to 7 nanometer. Intel's still stuck on 14 nanometer, which I was just alluding to earlier. Um, so, uh, you know, you know, TSMC continues to... to to work in that seven nanometer area, although we've heard a lot of excitement about that this summer. Um, yeah, you know, they're also claiming it'll allow their customers to get to market faster uh, and that their yields are going up. So if all this is true, right, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, faster time to market, better throughput, you know, requiring fewer layers, higher yields that's that's you know good not just for chip men or basically chip designers but also uh for consumers because all those things should reduce uh uh reduce the cost and increase the frequency on the products so yep you know not going to be going after intel or amd in the pc processor area but uh this is good this is a good thing. And, uh, you know, kind of another uh, Billy Talis and Anton Shilov over at uh, Anantech also talking about what's going on and uh, talking about the PPA improvements and the new process technologies. And it's pretty crazy, right? Uh, Samsung Foundry, um, you know, they're not revealing who their first 7LPP uh, partner is or their customer is. But it's crazy. Like one of the, one of the, one of the slides in the Samsung uh, – uh, from the Samsung deck that Anantech references, um, you know, they're talking about seven nanometer FinFET EUV uh, 2018, uh, five to four nanometer FinFET EUV 2019, three nanometer uh, in 2020. Um, you know, so I am very curious about this. Um, 20% fewer mass in the production of the chip. It's just, it's pretty crazy to look at this. Um, if, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> you know, lower processors has always meant good things for us. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's a way forward. <coughs> it's also interesting. Uh, one of the things they also show in the uh, uh, in the uh, slides that Nantech has is this crazy. Uh, you know, R versus EUV set um, and how much uh, clearer, I guess is the word they use, but it's amazing how much more defined the circuit layout is, um, and uh, which means it can be yeah. more precise with the layout of the circuit. And that's uh, that's pretty slick. I'm excited for Samsung. And I'm excited for you and me, because this should be more more awesome for less money. This episode of This Week in Computer Harbor brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Um, let's talk about buying a home for a minute. Alan, you, you love buying houses. It's like your favorite thing after beer and, and, and video games, right? You mean like 20 years spent in the Navy moving from place to place every three years, <laughs> sometimes trying to buy houses each time? Uh, no. I mean, <laughs> it was, it was, you know, do you ever think about interest rates? Uh, more than I want to ever. <laughs> you ever worry about interest rates going up? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness! So, yeah, in you know, we we had these like rock bottom interest rates forever. Um, interest rates are going up. Nobody knows what the Fed's going to do. Um, anxiety. Yeah, you know, what would have been great if there was just some nice app uh, I could just you know fire up on my phone and and just like, hey, I'm interested in buying that house. Let me see if I can get a I'm mortgage so, and just like so, you know click some buttons. So glad you brought that up. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Let's talk about uh, great. the power buying process. Too late for Alan's last purchase, just in time for you. Uh, Quicken Loans, um, they're trying to do something to make getting a mortgage, buying a house less emotionally traumatizing. And I think it's a good thing. Uh, they call it the power buying process. It's three basic steps. You answer some questions. They check it for you. You check your credit to give you pre-qualified approval. Um, step two, they're going to verify your income, your assets, your credit. They're going to do it in less than 24 hours, and they're going to give you a verified approval. Their goal is to give you the strength of a cash buyer. Third step, the final step, once you're verified, you qualify for their all-new exclusive rate shield approval. This is great. Um, they lock up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. If rates go up, right? Rates go up, they're going to hold your rate at the same. But if rates go down, they will drop your rate to match the lower rates on the market. It's a win-win situation. It doesn't matter. Rates go up, they'll hold your rate. Rates go down, they'll drop your rate. It's the kind of thinking you'd expect from America's largest mortgage lender. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash twit. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. That's rocketmortgage.com slash twit. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. Whisper mode. I had to talk about this. <laughs> Uh, A-L-E-X-A's going live with Whisper Mode. Um, something that they teased at, uh, at the event last month, but they announced all of the products. I would also like to point out, we got a couple of great emails on Tech Thing from uh, people who are uh, visually challenged or have uh, visual impairment. And for them, the idea of a microwave that they can talk to is a game changer because microwaves are notoriously difficult uh, to deal with if you're blind. But uh, so they demonstrated whispering a request. And I'm going to quote. Uh, I'm going to quote TechCrunch here. Uh, they demonstrated how whispering a request, like play a lullaby to Alexa, would trigger the voice assistant to respond in kind. Whisper mode officially going live, rolling out to users in the U.S. Uh, and the the idea is that you don't have to be like A L E X A. Please make me a sandwich. Um, you can whisper softly to elect in the dark, which could be really creepy, uh, depending on who you are, what you're saying, and, and who can hear you. But uh, I thought it was pretty cool, uh, you know, having raised children, uh, and, you know, I would be terrified to have, you know, play a lullaby and have a Oops, sorry, did it twice. Uh, A-L-E-X-A, turn around and you know respond at the normal volume, uh, waking up the child and causing me to weep softly in the darkness. Um, but the idea is is, is giving A-L-E-X-A uh, a little more uh, awareness of what context it's being used in. I think it's a, an interesting step. I'll be very curious to hear how it works uh, in the field. And uh, I, uh, I'm very, 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 very curious about that one. So... You know, the, yeah. uh, that's cool. So keep an eye it out for cool. that. Try whispering to your ALEX. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I guess you have to kind of be close. Well, you know, yeah. Just like, <laughs> like lean uh, over to it. Yeah, so what about this palm palm? This fascinates me. So palm. Palm basically got subsumed into HP. It got spun back. It basically got shut down at that point. They, they did a couple models. TCL bought the Palm, basically branding rights. And if you've ever been in 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 you know Best Buy or uh, or Walmart, and and you see, my personal favorite was a Polaroid DVD player, is like ten years ago, um, or Westinghouse doing LCD flat panels, and you know basically zombie brands where the, the brand is gone. The company is gone, 
but somebody bought the rights to the brand because it's familiar. People are like, oh, yeah, I used to love my Polaroid camera. I'll try a Polaroid television. Um, <laughs> it's probably not going to be as satisfying as a Polaroid camera, but, you know, they've got your money and you're out the door, so they're happy. Um, this I'm a little less concerned about uh, because uh, uh, I've been really impressed, uh, as has everybody with TCL's television in the last couple of years. Um, things supposed to be about the size of a, tech, uh, a credit card is what Ars Technica is writing on this. And uh, it's tiny. Um, you know, Android 8.1, not Palm. So don't worry about the fact that there's no operating system or developers anymore. So it, it, it is an Android device, 3.3 inch display, uh, 3.8 by 2 inches in total. It's tiny. Uh, Qualcomm Snapdragon 435, 3 gigs of RAM, and 800 milliamp hour battery, USB C, awesome, Wi Fi, Bluetooth, and LTE. Um, you know, this is. I think this is really cool. Uh, whether or not it's usable, uh, I think Josh wrote this up on PC Per, and he was like, eh, he kind of like, it's not going to have the power to do things. I'm like, I think he's got plenty of power as somebody who runs a, a mid range Android phone right now. Um, whether or not the screen is usable and what it looks like, I'm really curious about that. Um, but uh, they've got like offices in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> The uh, the Palm Palm uh, literally is what the name is. Uh, I'm really kind of curious about that one. I'm also really curious what a 3.3 inch screen feels like. Um, that's really small. Um, it's really 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 small. Um, you know, I'm I'm like trying to remember the size of the screen on my wife's iPhone, and. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about that. Like Android on a device that small um, is really interesting to think about. Yeah, so uh, we were talking about this on the podcast last night, and the the price is sort of like smartwatch pricing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then it, you you kind of venture into like, do you really do you really need this if you're gonna pay smartwatch pricing, right? right. Like maybe if it was a little bit cheaper. Then you might start finding extra uses for it, or you know the, the argument uh, being thrown around was like, yeah, you want to go to the beach, you don't want to drag your twelve hundred dollar, you know, hunk hunk of glass to the beach <laughs> and like go surfing with it and like you know right. maybe maybe ruin it potentially or drop it on concrete somewhere, and uh, you know if you're more active, maybe you just want to have something phone like with you just to sure. do a text really fast, you know, um, but still that price point, is, it's it's kind of high. Um, for that thing, and it's not just the price point that you also have to. Okay. Yeah, three fifty, but you also have to add it to your uh, <laughs> to your cell plan, and it has like an eSIM I think in it, and so that's an extra ten bucks a month on top of that just to have this thing kind of tethered, uh, you know, and it shares your number, so it's not like it's not even its own line, uh, mm -hmm. because again, it's acting very much like a smartwatch, but I don't know, we weren't, we were kind of like eh on it <laughs> during the podcast if it was like 150 or 200 then you can see so you can start you know hey that's right you know maybe you just have that as a more convenient thing that you wouldn't mind kind of trashing um while your more expensive phone was kind of sitting off somewhere a little bit mm -hmm. safer but that's kind of where we left it last night when we were discussing i'm kind of curious I meaning you know it's it's i'd be very curious what the camera's like 12 megapixel real camera 12 megapixel Rear camera, um, IP68 water resistance is pretty cool. Three, so I, I checked. Um, you know, the iPhone SE has a four-inch screen, uh, and this would be, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, you know, considerably higher resolution. I want to yeah. say if I'm I'm reading this right, but the, uh, um, I mean, the specs are the specs are decent. It's just yeah. You know, yeah. but it's, it's only between be, the price, I think, uh, you know, the, between the price, the use case, and you know, I guess it's something that would have to catch on. <laughs> I think the issue is, I think for, for me, the issue is that it, it's it's Verizon only at this point. So yeah, and There's you have to too. Verizon number share. I don't think they're that much. Gosh, I, the, no, uh, I don't think Verizon's that bad. It's just you, you you're not going to change carriers just for this thing. I would imagine. No, but I wonder how many people are going to, 
Yeah, so it's twenty bucks. So it's twenty bucks a month per device to do. Uh, this no, that's for non-number share. Yeah, this is supposed okay. to be ten. That's for non-number share devices. My apologies. Right. Yeah, it's. It, they make it so easy to find the cost of things on Verizon.com. Excuse me, VerizonWireless.com. Yeah, ten dollars, man. Ten bucks a month on the cost of a Verizon phone bill is not much. Um, no, that that part of it's not bad. That doesn't matter. On top of three fifty, on top of it's a very limited use capable thing, right? How do you know you haven't used it? It could be wonderful. Well, you may use um, it and find out it makes your life complete. Which probably really maybe. piss off your wife, but <laughs> 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 but I digress. Oh man, if you're a big fan of. Uh, of the Surface Pro, but you're not a big fan of some of Microsoft's engineering decisions. You have an option, Galaxy Pro, uh, I should say the Galaxy Book 2. Uh, Chris Welch over at The Verge calls it Samsung's answer to the Surface Pro. Um, $1,000 Galaxy Book 2, uh, Windows 2 and 1, always connected. It's got a Snapdragon 850 processor inside of there. Uh, and a VRAM design that is, quote, extremely close to the Surface. And if you look at that design, boy... It really is extremely close to the service. Goes on sale November second. Verizon, ATT, Sprint are going to offer uh, uh, the Samsung uh, Galaxy Book Two with LTE plans, um, capable of gigabit, cl gigabit class LTE. Uh, and there's say I, I like this quote: "Multi workday battery on a single charge." The battery estimate, Mr. Welch writes, is up to 20 hours. So. Uh, Atmos support in the speakers. I'm actually testing a laptop right now with Atmos uh, speaker support. I have complicated feels about it that I won't get into until the review is done. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're a fan of the Surface Book design, you'll probably be a fan of this. And I do love the fact um, that it looks like it's got USB-C instead of irritating customized power supplies, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, 2160 by 1440 on the 12-inch uh, SMA AMO LED, um, 128 gigabytes of storage, four gigabytes of RAM. Um, it is an ARM device, so it is uh, it is out there if you are looking for something that is not a Surface. Um, I thought this was kind of fun. Skydio's self-flying drone can be controlled using just an Apple Watch. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? I don't care if everything goes wrong. I just, you know, there's moments, um, you know, I'm not necessarily, um, man, I, I just, we're, we're, I, two, we're two steps away from Michael Knight calling Kit on his watch. Yes. Which he used to do on television yes. in the eighties. So, uh, it, it, yeah, we're, we're, we're getting awfully close. <laughs> Really I do have to say, instead I, of a car, we just jumped right to the flying thing, doing it. Right. This uh, Nick Stat wrote that one up for The Verge, and I think the most delightful part is I'm pretty sure I've been in the place where he recorded the video where it pans out and pans back. Um, <laughs> you know, so uh, I just, uh, you know, it's cool. Uh, it'll capture. You know, it's yeah. I did. I am fascinating. Uh, I am fascinated by looking at it. Um, it's not cheap, right? It's a two thousand dollar drone uh, from Skydio's website or from Apple. But uh, I just, I just, I just found it deeply fascinating. Um, really simple set. If you look at the uh, screen there, I think they have. There it is. You can see the the controls on the screen, and yeah. they're super simple. Um, yeah, it it's is. a rotate it's really option just, you know, that uses the crown. It's just like, it's just like at, you know, prompting or initiating various very simple directions, like just yeah. follow. Yeah, right? and it avoids right. It, it avoids obstacles. So you know, he basically ran it up. He, all he had to do was sort of like, you know, did this pull away, and all he had to do was scroll on the phone. The the drone shoots out. Would have been nice if yeah. he turned around and then like ran it through the trees afterwards to show the self avoiding stuff, but. Uh, uh, I don't know. You know, it, it's I, I I'm fascinated watching drones finally sort of live up to what they've been talking about being able to do with them for the last couple of years. Um, you know, I still think I'm going to freak out the first time I see somebody like cycling or running with their drone following along behind them. But uh, I'm sure in 10 years, everyone will be having one of these following their children home. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, if I'm not following my child with a drone, I'll be considered an unworthy parent. <laughs> so, you know, I got that to look forward to. And, uh, yeah, if you go to thehelm.com, by the way, I'm very curious about this one and a little uptight about it. Um, uh, the company announced the Helm Personal Server. And uh, it is uh, one of the things we talked about uh, in the past. Uh, certainly, I mean, going all the way back to the screensavers a thousand years ago, is the challenge of running your own. Like, you may want the privacy of running your own email server, um, but you have to not screw it up. And uh, this is interesting because they, they're basically selling you a chunk of hardware for $499. It's 100 bucks a year or $99 a year uh, for the service after the first year. And um, it gets a static IP address from Helm's gateway service and then configures an email server you can run out of your house. And uh, yeah. you know, makes gives you your own personal uh, email provider in a box for $499. And I was, I was kind of fascinated by that. Um, and, you know, they basically say they can't access your emails. Everything says to sell TLS. Um, you know, it's not going to work with your current email address. Um, you know, uh, you know if, you can't, if you don't have a custom domain, right, on Gmail or Yahoo Mail or, or Hotmail or Outlook, you're going to have to create a new email address. Um, you can use, if you have a custom email address, you can use it with your current email address. Um, I was kind of fascinated by it. Um, yeah, it's not that big of know, a device either, actually. Uh, uh, that picture on the circuit breaker, you know, uh, there is it's sitting next to a next to a cell phone on a, yeah. on a kitchen counter, and it's actually like not that large of a de- of a thing. Um, so you know, you know, interesting. You can just kind of sit it next to your router somewhere in your house. You know, if you if you really want uh, your if you're one of those people that wants your data to be on all things you control, but you kind of don't want to deal with the hassle of trying to maintain right. and operate your own email server, this is for you, right? Like, it, you know, mm-hmm. it's, uh, and as far as email servers go, if it's just right. a personal email server, it doesn't need to be this insane piece of hardware. Yeah. Um, and it, it also, I mean, it, it kind of brings it back to when we talk about VPNs. It's like, well, you know, do you trust Helm? If you trust Helm, you're great. Um, it seems yeah. to be a very thoughtfully designed product. Um, it's got a, a battery on board, so if there's power outage, it's supposed to gracefully shut itself down. Um, power returns, it'll turn itself back on. Um, you know, it can't deliver emails to you, um, but, uh, you know, they're basically saying, uh, uh, you know, they remind you that that email servers, if if they try to send you and, and your server's not there, uh, the sender's email server will probably uh, uh, retry. retry. Yeah, over yeah. time. Um, I thought that was kind of fascinating. Um, yeah, I mean, you I know, also email, love that they, email protocol is is pretty robust for that sort of thing. I mean, because you get yeah. you get outages on the internet, just to generally speaking, and emails yeah. still make it where they're going, so that's not a huge yeah. concern really. And they also, they actually automatically do encrypted backups of it so that, you know, (laughs) if your helm is stolen or, you know, goes down in a house fire or you lose it, um, it, you actually... And they're they're uh, doing the backups for you? Like they're they're housing the backups? Quote, backups are encrypted with a key that only you have. So, yeah, that's part of that $99 a year service fee. Oh, I mean, that's, you know, that's not bad. No. Really? No. No, I'm actually... uh, yeah, that's I'm actually kind of impressed. So, more on that as we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, anything exciting going on at PC Per this week? Uh, Ken is uh, still. Things? Ken has been uh, bouncing off the walls. Where we've been like, you know, <laughs> fanning him to keep him cool, um, while he's uh, been pulling his hair out, uh, doing GPU reviews, as you saw just by those those couple of RTX twenty. 70 reviews uh, he pumped out, and he's working on Intel CPU stuff because, uh, you know, it's supposed we're supposed to see the new Intel CPUs that have been leak after leak after leak. Uh, the, the review embargo, I think, is tomorrow. Um, so there's that, and we might even run to Micro Center and pick up some of the, uh, some of the uh, versions or the models of that new line that we weren't sampled, just to have a, kind of a bigger, rounder picture. Of everything, um, mm-hmm. of course, we won't be able to have those results right away. But you know, if we do pick those up, might trickle out some additional uh, Intel CPU reviews, like during the following week, maybe. So there's that. Uh, I'm working on. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to get the um, 
the My Digital Discount, uh, what is it, the BPX Pro. Those mm -hmm. came out uh, a couple weeks back, uh, and I have samples of all capacities, uh, all tested and reviewed, and they actually looked pretty darn good. Cool. Um, they're beating 970 Evos in some areas. Really? And this is the same, yeah, this is the same kind of product uh, at a significantly lower cost with, I, I believe, the same five-year warranty. Um, and just, you know, kind of kind of taking uh, 970 Evos to, to church in a couple of, uh, in a couple of uh, results, which was impressive, uh, yeah. especially given the price. So, yeah, I mean, this is, this is good stuff coming as far as, you know, starting to see NVMe SSDs start encroaching into what was not too long ago, uh, SATA SSD prices. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that's good. Uh, there's also, um, crucial, well, Micron slash crucial, uh, launched a P1 SSD, which mm -hmm. is similar, similar, but not the same as the Intel 660 P that launched, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a couple months back. Right. Um, Silicon motion controller, the idea is you're trying to do a cost-effective, uh, you know, decent performing SSD, similar to that BPX Pro we were just talking about. Uh, but in this case, coming from Crucial, uh, with their name on it, the the Intel part, the 660p, mm -hmm. it was supposed to launch in like two or three different capacities and everything, but we've only kind of seen it spotty. Like only, I right. think only the one terabyte model has been uh, commonly found, but like the half a terabyte one and the two terabyte one's not anywhere. Um so this P1, uh, we'll see if that kind of stays, you know, on the shelves a little better or it gets stocked a little bit better and hopefully for similar prices as the 660p. I think that's part of the reason you couldn't find a 660p anywhere is because that the prices were pretty darn low right. um, for, for, for those parts. Uh, and then wherever you could find them, it was over the MSRP. Um, so now that there's just another line of kind of similar products, uh, based on the same hardware, probably, you know, Micron probably did their own tweaks to the firmware compared to Intel. But when the base platform is similar and the flash is, it's still Intel slash Micron flash. It's the same flash. Um, oh, speaking of which, uh, something broke about, I think, 10 or 20 minutes ago uh, really? while we were talking. And that is um, Micron announces intent to acquire remaining interest in IM Flash Technologies joint venture. So IMFT, which is the Intel slash Micron venture of them making Flash and Crosspoint together, right? Um, that's been going on for like, I want to say like a decade or close to a decade now. It's been many years that that venture has been going on. Um, well, uh, it's been recently announced that Intel and Micron are going to part ways. And right. uh, it sounds like I don't have all the gory details, but it sounds like uh, Micron wants to buy out like Intel's part of the development related with uh, probably in particular Crosspoint because they're talking about Crosspoint a lot in this announcement. Uh, I'm not sure how that works as far as like maybe they just don't want to have to pay like royalties on Intel's portion of, you know, because right. it's sort of like a 50-50 thing, right? Um, so maybe they want to be able to you know, and I think both companies can still continue developing. It's just that they're not sharing anymore. Um, and and maybe there's some kind of IP thing that they need to like get sorted. So they want to buy out whatever that that kind of interest um, from the other side is to be able to, I don't know, I would imagine have some more freedom in the development of it moving forward. It's interesting that uh, Micron is harping so much on the cross point part of it throughout this this press release. Because up till now, uh, have you heard anything about any uh, Micron Crosspoint SSDs? Not Ever? really. Right. Um, Micron's been the company that has demoed some things at like Flash Memory Summit. They've had, you know, they were one of the first to have a prototype, and they're like, "Hey, here's Crosspoint. Here's how it, how fast it actually works when it's plugged into a computer." But Intel's the one that's shipping. Right, they're shipping uh, Optane memory. They're sh you know, Optane is the name Intel's branding for Crosspoint, uh, you know, cr Crosspoint uh, enabled devices or devices that have Crosspoint installed in them. And there's an awful lot of Optane SSDs coming out of Intel. I mean, I think just in one quarter they shipped like a million Optane memory parts. That's just the caching thing that 
is not necessarily super popular, but apparently plenty of OEMs were putting it in systems and accelerating hard disks and, and whatnot with the with that tech. Um, you know, and then there's also the you know the 900p, 905p. There's you know uh, a bunch of enterprise parts as well using using uh, Crosspoint. So Micron's not shipping any. So it's like, what are they going to do? And uh, in this press release, they talk about uh, late 2019. So maybe that's maybe Micron's just kind of been holding back and letting Intel, uh, you know, do the big push and the big, uh, you know, try to try to sell Crosspoint in devices. And and in some ways, I can see it's kind of a smart move for Micron because they can just kick back while Intel's doing all this legwork, educational wise, trying to because that's been a big uh, hurdle. For for Crosspoint is how do you show people that it's actually faster and in what ways is it faster and how does it actually benefit you in a system compared to just using Flash? Um, Micron can just kind of kick back, let Intel, you know, do all that and you know education, and then enough people will probably already know the strengths of Crosspoint by the time Micron goes to ship some parts using it. Everybody will know, hey, those are those are pretty good products for you know whichever specific use cases. Um, you know, people have started using them for. So interesting there. Uh, I'll probably post something up at PC Per about it once I can wrap my brain around this press release a little bit better. I was trying to skim it while we were talking about other things. So um, <laughs> I, I will, so I was I will excited probably to have that it. stuff sneak in. Yeah, yeah, I just oh. it totally snuck in like right while we were while we were talking. So figured worth okay. mentioning before we uh and and maybe maybe we'll, me or Ryan uh, talk a little bit more about it next week if we have some more detail. Sounds like a plan. Uh, Shannon's got a review of Dell's XPS 13 9370. That's the developer's edition running Ubuntu Linux. Uh, it's nice to see Linux once again on a, uh, a premium laptop. I put a 400 gigabyte SanDisk micro SD card in this Motorola G6. Um, if you're wondering if that worked, go over to techthing.com. We also talk about Wi-Fi 6 and 5 and 4, but mostly 802.11ax. Which promises the world, much like 802.11 ended. Um, mm-hmm. I was also laughing because the numbering scheme for me is highly amusing. Because, you know, uh, you know, if as the numbers, you know, it's it's one higher, that's better. And I'm like, 802.11n wasn't better than G for most people, at least until 802.11ac came out. So, uh, f- yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't. Uh, I don't want to go down that particular uh, hidey hole, but uh, I thought it was interesting that after all these years, um, the Wi-Fi Alliance has decided that, you know, it's got to be simpler. People should just know. And uh, we'll see. We'll see how that works. I'm waiting for Wi-Fi 6, 57,000, and then another manufacturer figuring out how to make it 62,000, and then another manufacturer doing uh, 62,500. Some other manufacturer will figure out a collection of random specs to put together to make eighty thousand. Um, not that and I'm targeting. And it'll get to the, and it'll get to the point where you lay Thanksgiving dinner on the table cold, and you put a couple of routers on either end of the table. <laughs> you let them talk to each other for a few minutes, and right. dinner's ready. Dinner's ready. Mm-hmm. Turkey by router, ladies and gentlemen. You heard it here first in This Week in Computer Hardware. And if you're not a regular listener to This Week in Computer Hardware, thank you so much for listening. Please head right on over to twit.tv slash twitch and get yourself some links, some RSS feeds. Find us on your favorite podcasting tool. Or you can just listen to your favorite episodes or the older episodes, the latest episodes. Any episode of Twitch should be available at twit.tv slash twitch. Uh, you can find Mr. Malvin Tano, as you may have guessed by this point, over at PCPer.com. You can find me over at TechThing, T-E-K-T-H-I-N-G.com. Or if you're into home theater and audio, uh, check out AVXL.com. It's a podcast you with Robert Heron. And uh, thank you so much for listening. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Alan Malvin Tano. We'll catch you next week on Twitch.